really, we are just so thankful that uh, we could be with our spiritual family this weekend. And um, I pray that as I share the word today, there's a stirring of my heart to invite us into this place of prayer. I know we all pray, but I wanted to share the glories, the eternal glories of prayer, and to get us excited as a spiritual family to pray and connect with God and converse with God, and rule with God, govern with God as the church. Um, so let's pray before we get into the word. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you for this glorious, eternal uh, gift of prayer that we get to connect with the CEO of the cosmos, um, the God who created the entire universe, who upholds the entire universe with the word of his power, the one who is the very radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature that we get to connect with the most powerful being of the universe through prayer. And so we uh, ask you that you will come and visit us today, that each and every one of us, that we will leave today with an encounter with the living God. Father, I ask you that you would uh, stir our hearts and cultivate uh, an atmosphere of prayer, even in this community, even in Port Ranch, even in this region, in this city, and that, Father, we just look towards that day when the entire globe is going to be filled with the praises of your people and the bride and the spirit. The spirit and the bride will say, come as a praying and spirit-filled church, and Jesus, you're going to break in, and you're going to come for the second time and establish your kingdom here on the earth. And so I thank you that we can be part of something that is greater than ourselves, and uh, we can be part of your plans and your deepest desires. So I pray even today as we talk about prayer that you would stir our hearts once again. Remind us of our identity, our primary occupation to pray. And that you would, you would empower us and galvanize our prayer life. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Woo! Did y'all come with an expectation today? For an encounter with the living God. Oh, every time I come to church, I'm excited because I know for certain when the word of God is preached, you get what you preach. And when you preach about God, you're going to get God. And when we come to God with a hunger and a thirst, it says in God's word, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. I don't know about you guys. I don't want to stay in the fringes of a religious system. I want to be inside an intimate relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I pray that y'all came here with an encounter, for an encounter with the living God. Because if you come here hungry and thirsty, you're going to leave with God. And I mean, isn't that why we came to church this Sunday morning? Amen? Because we want to leave with an encounter. We don't want to leave with a program. We want to leave with the very presence of God. Come on. And I want to stir us even this morning of our wholehearted love towards our God and King, Jesus Christ. I mean, he is the most powerful being of the universe. There is a quote that I love. It says, if you love God and God loves you, you're already successful. Maybe some of you guys came here today with fears and anxieties and just kind of weighed down by the pressures of this life. And maybe even the pressure to perform, whether it's in your work or in your family, and you and kind of feeling down because you feel like your worth and your value has been minimized. I've got good news for you today. You are successful in the eyes of the Lord. There is now no condemnation in Christ Jesus. You're washed by the blood of the Lamb. You're made a kingdom of priests. If we could have God's perspective today. God's heart is so moved by every single one of us. The fact that we have come today to meet with Him. It says in God's Word that when we take one glance up at God, at Jesus, He is ravished. His heart is moved. He is excited. Oh, there is a God who is excited for each and every one of you by the fact that you are taking just even one glance up at Him. And, um, that's what happened the moment that we got born again and we became children of God. I have three daughters over there, beautiful daughters, and our relationship 
Our relationship is marked by communication. The fact that we can even communicate with each other. And I believe that um, the Lord set up this family unit to give us a glimpse of what it looks like in our prayer life. That when we communicate with our kids and we can establish this deep, a meaningful relationship with them, in the same way the Father wants to have that kind of relationship with us. I've shared this illustration before too, that every single one of my daughters is my favorite daughter. And every single one is different and unique, but I can't say that I love a daughter more than the other or less than the other. I love them equally. And I can confidently say that each of them are my favorite ones. And God is God. He's the God who created the entire cosmos. And he has the ability because in his heart has such infinite love and compassion for each and every one of us that we, each and every one of us in this very room can be, can be called God's favorite one. If y'all have never done that before, I invite you to do that right there in your seats, wherever you are. Just talk to God, to the Father. It might, it might not make sense to you and it might not be believable at the moment, but we are a people of faith, amen? We live by faith and not by sight. We don't live according to the accusations of what other people say or what other people's opinions may be towards us. But God has the final say over our lives. And if you've never done that before, just to come before God to the Father in heaven and say, God, I am your favorite one. I invite you to do that. God, I'm your favorite one. The enemy is going to try to throw at you all these things of your past and what you did this, this past year or like all these negative things to weigh you down. But the devil does not have the final say over your life. Come on, somebody. Amen. God has the final say. And I believe that when we get enraptured in the love of God in this way, we will have revelation of prayer that the moment that we pray, God is all ears. We literally get the full attention of the Father in heaven, the CEO of the cosmos. That gets me excited. And so today I want to invite us into a conversation of the glorious nature of prayer. Prayer is as mysterious and glorious as God is mysterious and glorious. Ah, oh, and that we get to talk to this God. It's staggering to think that we can actually communicate with the God who created the cosmos, who upholds the entire universe with the word of his power. We as Christians are known for prayer, but prayer may possibly become the most ne uh, neglected areas of our lives. I know I can attest to this. You know, I'm a missionary, and it, it seems like, oh, he must be praying like hours a day, but then the, sh the struggle is real, even for a missionary. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to pray because we live in a prayerless culture. We live in a culture where prayer is not the primary thing that we do. We don't get together Thanksgiving and the first thing that's on our minds is like, hey guys, let's have a prayer meeting. We don't think that way because we've grown up in an environment, in a culture that is prayerless. And I'm just stating the facts, you know, when I was growing up, when we're growing up here in America, it's, prayer is not the first thing. Prayer meetings are, are not the, the first thing that comes into my, into my mind when we think about the word fun. Right? And that's why there's this preacher, he said that if you want to see the popularity of the pastor, come on Sunday morning. If you want to see the popularity of an evangelist, go to a conference. But if you want to see the popularity of God, show up at a prayer meeting. Right? We show up on Sunday mornings, I don't know with what motives you came today. Maybe y'all thought that, oh, okay, Pastor Peter's not preaching, we have, we have another pastor, maybe I shouldn't have come today. I don't know. I don't know what y'all are thinking, what motives you may have today. But according to this preacher, he's saying that, come on Sunday if you want to see how popular the pastor is. Come, come to a conference if you want to see the popularity of an evangelist or a revivalist. But show up at a prayer meeting if you want God. And so if we want to see the life of the church, I believe that it's found in our prayer meetings. If people are showing up at the prayer meetings, it means that people love God. Because at a prayer meeting where no one's preaching a nice message or a sermon, there is no 
there, there are no other kind of uh, like incentives to be at a prayer meeting unless that you, you came for an encounter with God. And so what I'm getting stirred up these days is that our lives and our families and our communities would be marked by prayer. Because if our families would be marked by prayer, it means that we are a friend of God. We're not a friend of this world. We're not, we're not a friend of um, what this world can offer or familiar with those. We want to be more familiar with God himself. And that's why prayer meetings and when we gather to pray is so um, revealing because it means that our primary reward in this life is not about programs, but it's the very presence of God. And I pray that the presence of God, we will become so enamored by Jesus, so apprehended by this God, that we would want His presence more than anything. Because God has created us in such a way that He wants to rule the entire universe and give us the blueprints and the instructions on how to govern this life, our families, and, and our regions, our cities, through prayer. That's how, that's how He's designed it. And the more, the more we become in touch with that, we become in touch with God. If we lose touch with prayer, we begin to lose touch with God. And so, I want to call our spiritual family to be men and women of prayer. Oh, come on. I, I, have a, I have a question. I've always wanted to ask this question. When, when you enter into this place of prayer and worship, how many of you, with a raising of, of hands, do you actually feel like the presence of God, like you experience Him? Like, when he shows up, you just know. When you know, you know. Type of thing. How many of you guys, when you pray, you feel, you experience the presence of God? All right, all right, there we go. I'm not the only one. Hallelujah. Come on. And that's what I live for. See, I used to be a drug addict. Um, good thing my parents aren't here. <laughs> They hate it whenever I talk about my past. It's, it's a Korean thing. Um, <laughs> they don't want anything to mar my reputation, you know. But I can be real with y'all because we're a spiritual family. And when I used to, when I used to do drugs and things like that, we were, I believe that we were created for pleasure. But those drugs were just a counterfeit compared to what God had for me. And it wasn't until I was born again in 2008, it just took one encounter to change everything. And then that's when I started to get addicted with the presence of God. If y'all have never experienced the manifest glory of the presence of God, I, I want to give you good news that there's more. There's more. There is absolutely more to this life. There is pleasures forevermore. It says in Psalm chapter 16 that... There, that there's fullness of joy in God's presence and there's pleasures forevermore. It's not just this conceptual thing. We literally get to experience God. And so in the Hebrew mindset, these spiritual realities and our physical life may be divorced, but in the Hebrew mindset, it was all one thing. For example, if I just had a conceptual religious relationship with my wife, she would have divorced me. Y'all get my drift, right? If I just like knew about my wife, I just knew some things, but I never spent time with her, never was with her, never would have quality time with her, wouldn't take her out on dates. It was just kind of like conceptual understanding, so, some religious understanding. Because even the Pharisees, they had a religious understanding. They knew the Bible from cover to cover. But when God actually showed up and was in front of them, they missed God's visitation. Because it was just a conceptual religious understanding. And so sometimes when I, whenever I evangelize and I share the gospel, I use that illustration. If I had that religious relationship with my wife, I just show up on a Sunday. You know, I spend like 30, 30 minutes maybe singing to her. Um, and then hear what she has to say and then, you know, have some small talk and I'm like, all right, I'll see you next week. <laughs> that, 
that is not going to work in our marriage. We spend every day together. It's a living, vibrant, loving relationship. And wouldn't God create us in that way so that we can have that kind of living relationship with Him? And so even this morning, I was excited to come. Even if I didn't have to preach, that I actually get to encounter God. That it's, it's not some kind of program. It's that I get to encounter the presence of the living God. And there are different dimensions to experiencing God. It says in James chapter 4, 7, submit to God. Submit to His leadership. Submit to His instructions. To His blueprints on how to encounter Him. And I assure you, I promise you, if we follow according to the blueprints and the instructions that God has given to us in this book, we would absolutely be encountered by God and we'll never be the same. Back in 2016, the Lord, um, the Lord challenged me to preach the word as it is written in God's word. And he, he challenged me to preach on repentance and believing in Jesus, being water baptized and receiving the Holy Spirit. And every single time I've preached this message like this, there, every single person has had an encounter with the living God. Sometimes we can't experience all that God has for us, perhaps because there are some idols in our lives. Perhaps there are some distractions. Perhaps there are some hindrances between us and God. But when that hindrance is removed through repentance, by coming to God and saying, God, I'm sorry, I'm gonna forsake that ungodliness and worldly passions, and I'm going to turn to you. I want, I want a relationship with you. Thank you, Jesus, that you saved my soul, that I don't have to spend all of eternity in hell, that I get to be a kingdom of priests before you, and that I get to live this life with you, and then just bury your old life in water baptism, and then be filled with the Holy Spirit. Whew. Whatever we, I have, whenever I preach that message, God would always show up and people would be encountered by the Lord. And so if there's anyone here who's not been water baptized yet, see Pastor Peter and get baptized this year or maybe on Christmas. Whew. And infant baptism do doesn't count. Nowhere in the Bible can you find infant baptism saves. It says, whoever believes and is baptized is saved. As a baby, you can't believe on the Lord. It's the faith of your parents. Infant baptism doesn't count. But if y'all have not been baptized under your own faith, I encourage you, get baptized and get discipled. Reach out to Pastor Peter. Reach out to the deacons and the elders here um, and get baptized. I assure you, God is going to encounter you in a mighty way. Yeah, and so if we have revelation of what happened at the new birth, prayer would, like we would be in awe and thankfulness to God. Remember the one thief that was on the cross that stood up for Jesus and said, Jesus, remember me. When you come into your kingdom, y'all remember that, right? Y'all remember that story where the thief said, remember me, Jesus, when you go into your kingdom. And Jesus said, truly, you'll be with me in paradise. I can imagine just being in utter shock. I can imagine him in being in utter shock as he ascended with Christ into heaven. And I can imagine him saying, only if I knew I was a king, I wouldn't have lived like a thief. Can you imagine that? For all of his life, until that moment that he saw Jesus, he lived as a robber. He lived in ungodliness and ungodly passions. And the moment that he was translated from earth into heaven, he was just shocked that he was, a, he was actually a king. He was royalty before God. And that he gets to spend all of his days in eternity communing and having this union, this intimacy with God forever. I can imagine him saying, if only I knew I was a king, I wouldn't have lived like that. 
The Apostle John wrote in Revelation 1, 5, 6, To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve as God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. And the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 2, 9, it says that we are a royal priesthood. I don't know about y'all, but I'm so glad that this is our occupation. Our primary occupation is not the occupation that y'all have right now. It might feel like your primary, but according to the Word of God, your primary occupation is to be a priest. It's to be a priest before the Lord. And if there's anything that I want to catch in this life, is understanding how to, how to move the heart of God, how to minister to His heart. I've been locked in on these verses this season, and it's staggering to me that God would transform a lowly sinner like me into a priest who can minister before God in heaven. Only God's chosen people, Israel and the Levites, could serve God at the temple. And, the, and only the high priest could enter into the Holy of Holies, the very presence of God, where they had to tie a rope around the ankle of a priest. And they would wait outside, and they would have bells on his ankles, because if you entered into the Holy of Holies, into the very presence of God, and he had sin on his life that he wasn't consecrated of or purified, he would have dropped dead in the presence of God. Even Uzzah, he was not a Levite priest. He was carrying the Ark of the Covenant, just touched the Ark of the Covenant, which was the very presence of God. And the power of God came, and he died on the spot. The presence of God is terrifying. If there is any hint of sin in our lives and we approach God, we would drop dead like that high priest who has sin on his life. And so they'll be waiting outside with a rope that's tied around his ankle. The moment that he died, they would pull him out because they couldn't go into the presence of God because they would drop dead in the presence of God. That's how powerful the presence of God is. Only God's chosen people in Israel, the Levites, could serve God at the temple, and the high priests could enter into that Holy of Holies. But check this out. This is the good news, y'all. Through the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about the blood of sheep and uh, bulls that can only cover for some sin, for sin for a year for the Israelites. The, we have the blood of God. Y'all ever question your worth and value? You are worth the blood of God. You have the blood of God upon your lives. That no matter what anyone may say about your identity and who you are, Jesus has the final say, and Jesus says, I purchased you. You are mine. You belong to me. You are my people. And anyone and everyone who will try to hurt you, I'm going to hurt them back. That's, that's why Jesus is coming back at the end of the age. Because when there are people who are persecuting the church, you think God is just sitting from a distance and saying, and just kind of letting it happen, and he's like, he's okay with the church being hurt? No, he's not okay. He called the church his bride. We literally become the bride of Christ, because Christ has sacrificed his life in our place. Like we sang today, he sacrificed his life so that we could become the bride of Christ, so that we could be one with him. That's why we see the mystery of the oneness between God and man from our marriages. What a mystery that when the two can become one flesh, that anyone who turns to the Lord becomes one in spirit with Him. We literally get to become the people of God, His chosen race. And through the blood of Jesus, get all of our sins washed away, that even if we die right now, we'll be like that thief on the cross. Boom! We're in heaven, we're looking down on hell, and we're like, praise the Lord. <laughs> My goodness. Praise God. And then we have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Holy of Holies. He is the Holy of Holies in the Old Testament. But well, why is it that we are filled with the Holy Spirit right now and we're not dropping dead? Because we've got an advocate who is interceding on our behalf, Jesus Christ, who shed his blood. We're not talking about the blood of animals. Talking about the blood of God that was shed. And the very presence of God now dwells inside of us. The Holy Spirit. Our spirit, man, is the Holy of Holies. And when we have this kind of revelation, it gives flight to our prayers. But without revelation, prayer is a struggle. 
You know, we're, we're still kind of thinking like the thief on the cross. We're just kind of living our earthly life. But imagine if we had the revelation of what, 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 who we are on the other side, in God's perspective, the moment that Christ died for us. Oh, we're kings, we're priests. And we can, we can have our uh, chin up high and live confidently before God. We're already successful. God loves me, I love God. Even if I lost my life, if some terrorist came in here and then he gunned down me, right? I, won't, I wouldn't want to say gunned down all my life, right? It's kind of scary. I say that he was after me because I'm the preacher for today and he's like, I hate preachers, and then takes my life. I'm already successful. I'm not in fear of losing my life. Because I, my revelation is in another realm. You know, Don Miller, who, who wrote this popular book called Blue Like Jazz, he said that he didn't like jazz until he saw the jazz musician close his eyes and was transported to another realm that he began to love jazz. Because sometimes you have to see someone who loves something first so that you could actually love it yourself. Sometimes we don't fully grasp the love that we have for God until we begin to see somebody in love with God. And what I appreciate about Living Water Church is that when we first came here, I don't know, six, seven years ago, we used to have those prayer meetings over there, Pastor Peter, right? Like we're on our faces, we're on our knees, and we were just going after God, pressing in and going deep with God and praying together before the service started. And when I saw Pastor Peter praying, I was like, all right, this is the church. This is the church I want to call my home church. Sometimes we need somebody, we need someone who's in love with something or someone so that we can learn what it's like to be in love with something or someone. Back in 2016, I was reading through the Word, and I had so much of a religious understanding of God that I couldn't really... I didn't really have a living relationship with God until I started reading about the life and the teachings of Jesus. And I saw Jesus' prayer life. And we get a window into the life of Jesus' prayer life. In Hebrews 5-7, it says that Jesus with loud cries and with tears. He was loud when he prayed. And so when I had that picture, that mental picture of Jesus being really loud, that he's not just kind of like, you know, very, um, very quiet and reserved, but he was very loud. He was crying out to God, and the disciples saw that. They were like, wow, that, that kind of prayer life looks a bit different from the prayer life that we used to see. And it began to capture their imagination of what it looks like to have this intimate relationship with God. Whew. So I want to ask you, is your life marked by prayer? Is our church marked by prayer? God has made it crystal clear the way in which God relates to his people, much like we relate to our kids, to each other. God has designed the church to overflow in the power of God in prayer, overflowing into accessing heaven and changing history. This life is merely a 70, 90 year internship. The world will try to convince you the true success of material things, but the spirit will convince us that true success is not found in the world, but is found in God's word. I know today's family service, so I'm not going to go through all of the notes I have today. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But I want to um, I want to direct our attention to the key verse today, which is Isaiah 56, 7. And I want to solidify this understanding that God calls the church a house of prayer. God wants to mark our church as a house of prayer. Now, and this is, this is surprising because maybe we thought that preaching is the most important or evangelism is more important or missions is important. And it's strange for me to read this and say that my house shall be called a house of prayer, even as a missionary, because I'm all about saving souls. I'm all about doing this outward ministry to save people. But then what if, what if our primary occupation, our primary call as a people of God is to be ones who are marked with prayer? Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect my kids to go outside and to make money for our family. Like I wouldn't expect them to perform for us. They're already loved 
And in the same way, God doesn't want us to perform for Him. He wants us to be in communication with Him. And so if there's anything that we need to be gripped by and to catch the vision for, is to be men and women who communicate with God on a daily basis. And if we communicate with Him maybe like five minutes a day, then God, in Increase my capacity. Give me more revelation of who I am in your perspective. Give me a love for your word so that I can get transported into this other realm. Here in Isaiah 56, 7, it says, Even those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. That's the first time he emphasizes that his presence is a house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Maybe you might be thinking this is a future reality when Jesus comes back. And it's true. But Jesus repeats it three times in the three Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And he uses this very verse to solidify our identity as a church as a house of prayer. A house that rises in its incense of prayer before the Lord. It's not the house of preaching or the house of evangelism or the house of discipleship or deliverance. It's a house of prayer. And so if God would highlight this and emphasize this and solidify this identity, then shouldn't we as a community throw ourselves into what God has already revealed to us from His Scripture. And I believe that if we gave ourselves wholeheartedly to prayer, we will succeed in every area of our lives. Even David, when he saw that the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, was in Shiloh for 20 years, and when Saul was king, Saul didn't even care about the presence of God. The presence of God was completely neglected. But the moment that he became king, David took that Ark of the Covenant, the presence of the Lord, into the city of Jerusalem, set up, set up the presence of God right there in a tent, and for 33 years, there were, there were no wars. Everyone that came to fight against Israel for 33 years, they were all demolished. Why? I'm certain it's because the presence of God was central. If the presence of God is central, and we become like David, loving the presence of God so much that even in the Psalms it says that he will not rest until the presence of the Lord was in Zion. That he wouldn't rest his eyelids, he wouldn't even go to sleep until the presence of God was established. I believe that we're going to see a mighty move of God. And God is already moving in our midst. I'm seeing so many more people two months uh, later. I was here two months ago and it was a lot smaller, but then now this church is growing. And today I feel like I'm on assignment to stir our hearts to have a vision for prayer. Because 2020 and 2021 was a great reset. Everything was changed. But with every great reset, it's a new beginning. And I declare and decree that this next year that we're entering into is going to be a year of revival. It's going to be a year of revival. And I believe that God is establishing us as men and women of prayer. So our prayer life doesn't develop in a vacuum. It gets developed through intentionality, spending time with God, learning to linger with Him, carving out an hour, two hours of our day to spend time with God and His Word and in prayer. And David was such a great example, kind of like that jazz musician. We kind of don't know what it looks like to love God. Like, what does it look like to, to be a house of prayer? What does it look like to, to pray? But just like Don Miller saw that jazz musician and saw him closing his eyes and didn't care about the audience, he was completely transported to another realm and another dimension that in the same way, when we look in the life of David, he loved the presence of God so much that when he, he raised up that tent, he raised the 288 musicians, 400 music, uh, I mean 288 singers and 4,000 musicians and they worship the Lord day and night, night and day. I know we're living in a very prayerless culture. Like I said, prayer is not the first thing that comes into our minds when we think of fun, right? But what if prayer literally becomes our recreation? Can I dare to say that prayer and worship will become our form of recreation because 
God is so much better than anything that the world can offer. And that was it for David. David caught the excitement, the acceleration that comes from worship and prayer. And I really do sense that in this season, the Lord is marking us as men and women of prayer. If we can go to 1 Corinthians 2, 6 to 10. All right, this is my next illustration over here. It's exactly what the Father wants with us. He wants this close relationship with God. And I'm growing, I'm growing in my understanding of a father too. You know, I wouldn't say that I'm the perfect father, but then I know for certain if I, would, if I was more present for my kids, um, and if I spent more quality time with them, then our relationship would become way more solidified and would be blessed. It's the same way with God. And if there's anything that I want to develop in this life, it's my primary call, primary gift. I have to love God with all of my being, all of my heart, my soul and strength. And so today, I'm not speaking with the wisdom that is from, from the world. It says in 1 Corinthians 2, Yet we do, you, we do speak wisdom amongst those who are mature. A wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. All of this is passing away. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery. The hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen, and ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love Him. Wow. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. If we want to go deep with God, we need the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And perhaps that's why prayer is one of the most neglected ministries in the church. And whenever we talk about the Holy Spirit or even the gifts of the Holy Spirit, it becomes one of the most controversial things that we can talk about in church. Perhaps because of this very fact that the Spirit searches all things. The Spirit is the very presence of God. That if we want the wisdom of God in this, in this age, a wisdom that is not found in this age, but in the age to come from the kingdom of God, we need to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. We need to love God's presence like never before. Can I, can I cast a vision for our spiritual family to go deep with God and finish this year strong and to enter into 2022 searching for the deep things of God? Fellowship with the Holy Spirit. If y'all never been baptized, get baptized. S start over again. Get released into this new year, into new beginnings of a year of arrival. And catch a vision of Jesus as he's praying even in Gethsemane for us. Catch a vision of Daniel who would pray for 21 days and there was a war in the heavens. And God draws back the curtains. And then the angel shows up and says to Daniel, Oh man, greatly loved, that this angel came with this revelation, even on day one, the moment that you began to pray, to see people like David, who was an extravagant worshiper of Jesus. Whew. And that's something that I want to start establishing even, our, in, even in our own family as well. How can, I, how can I carve like one hour of prayer a day? How can I get my kids excited? And I think this is a great wrestle to have as parents and as leaders in this body. Praise God. And God is calling us even into the deep things of God. And if we don't know where to start with prayer, let's start in His Word. The Word is filled with prayers and examples we can follow. God has given us His Word to move our hearts. And when He moves our hearts and we speak His Word back to Him, it moves his heart, and then through the Holy Spirit inside of us, reveals more of his heart and his plans. Beloved, we're living in the days of Noah. We're living in times where people are oblivious to even the second coming of Jesus. But what if Jesus showed up today? What if he showed up tomorrow? I feel like we would wake up and we'd be like, man, if we only knew, we would have lived differently. And I think that is what God is calling.
calling us to, into this, he's calling us into this extravagant love, into this amazing, exhilarating, exhilarating relationship with him. And I want to end with this, this prayer. And there are prayers called the apostolic prayers, which can refresh the soul and strengthen our inner being and galvanize our resolve to serve the Lord. Ephesians 3.16, it says, according to the riches of his glory, that he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we can ask or think according to the power working inside of us. I pray that towards the end of this year, and even going into the next year, that we would know the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit that we would have the wisdom of God, that we would search the depths of God. We can't do it on our own, but God has sent the Holy Spirit. And I believe that God is gonna mark every single one of our lives with this insatiable hunger for the Holy Spirit. And I sense from the Lord, 2022, 2022 is gonna be an incredible year. And with every reset, there's a new beginning. And I believe that this year will be marked with a new kind of revival and a new resolve, with new resolutions, and that I believe our, our, our homes are literally going to become houses of prayer this season. And I don't know what God has in store, but even for this community as well, with the raising up of different leaderships, that, that God is going to mark this church with prayer like never before. So can we all come into agreement for our spiritual family? And um, if there is anything that the Holy Spirit was speaking to you about, about um, new resolves or new resolutions, even specifically in the arena of prayer, I just want to invite us even right now to prayer and that God would um, just solidify our identity as a house of prayer, that we would be a spiritual family, that we would be individuals and a spiritual family that prays. Can we do that? Let's pray.